So architectural diagrams in Salesforce are really important to really communicate your solutions to stakeholders within an organization. And so this is why I am heading up to the London Architect Community Group, where Matt Morris is gonna do a presentation on all, a load of his key architectural diagrams that he uses at his consultancy. Um, so it's gonna be a really cool event. And then we've got a bit of a workshop afterwards uh, on how you connect um, those diagrams to different stakeholders and different scenarios. So thank you to Elements Cloud, Provar and Own the Company for sponsoring the event. And well, here is the session. Yeah, go ahead. Nice. There we go. I've got cheeseburgers and fondle. It looks amazing. All right. Um, I should have come see you before, Tom, shouldn't I? Uh, hi, everyone. Um, I'm Matthew Morris. Nice to see so many familiar faces. Like dining out for free every night of the week. It's good to be back in the user group circuit, isn't it? Um, so. Um, and uh, yeah, that's the key thing about being an architect really, is uh, just winging it. Um, <laughs> and, 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 uh, and, uh, with, yeah, if you've got a picture, um, that's, that's always really helpful. So, um, so yeah, uh, Matthew Morris, I'm the UK CTO uh, for Salesforce Cap Gemini. Um, what does that mean? Um, it means that half my time spent as an architect, half of my time is spent trying to explain architecture and architectural considerations to our clients. Um, which involves things like, hmm, starting a Salesforce project in 2024 without something like Elements or something like Provar or something like a backup solution from own backup, you're kind of leaving yourself a bit exposed. So we're all in this together, I think, because um, it comes down to making that value argument. Um, so, they not have a HDMI cable here. No? There isn't one to plug into the screen. I get that from my clients, I'll be really good. Yeah. So, okay, now I've got a microphone. I've got a clicker, let's see if the clicker works. So it's diagram and Salesforce solutions and clicker doesn't work, so let's push it back. <laughs> there we go, it's the farewell tour. <laughs> so I think we, yeah, this is not the last time we'll do it, but you know, maybe, it, um, maybe it'll be uh, one of the last times. And um, as Nick said, when, when I came in, I'm not that tired on content again. Uh, and he's quite right actually, because it's been a while. Let me tell you how long it's been. Um, so I think the first thing I want to say is, I didn't start off as an architect, so if this is diagramming in the style of an architect, um, it's basically me doing an impression of being an architect and diagramming. Um, that's about as good as you get, it's about as good as the day job is, really. Um, so I started back in 1994, before there was an internet and business, and the only person with a PC on their desk was the project manager, because they had Microsoft Project. Still going today, I saw it, it's got great new features these days, 30 years on, amazing. Um, but um, then 2009 was my first Salesforce project, so 15 years in, first question we were asking was why the hell are we using the Salesforce thing, it was really different and really hard. However, 15 years on, I'm glad it did, so we'll take that. Um, so lots of user groups and certs and Dreamforce and you, some of you might recognise this from your own experiences as well because we've all been friends together along the way, but why is it the Fairmore Tour? Well, 
This cocktail really goes back about six and a half years, which is hard to believe. It's gone quick. So there's a couple of years in the middle that didn't count, I suppose, because we just don't register them. Um, but that's when I recorded Diagram Salesforce Solutions for Pluralsight uh, with a great leading light in Salesforce world, Don Robbins, elder statesman. I hope he doesn't mind me saying elder, but uh, elder statesman. And you know, he's a real passion for for learning and teaching. And um, great, he's a source of great quotes as well. Why do you teach? Why do you teach? Why do you teach, Don? So you so you can learn. Oh, okay. See, it's a form it's a form of wisdom. So there was a number of these, these done back in the day, um, and this is where I kind of pulled together the content that I had sort of put together over the last, over the previous couple of years, uh, because obviously I wasn't an architect before I did that, I was a consultant, and I was a bit of a hacker programmer, um, all that sort of stuff. Um, and then at the time I was working for a large consultancy called McKinsey, I was working with lots of enterprise architects, I was working with some people who were Salesforce architects, early Salesforce architects, um, and it, Certainly, you know, it was attractive to me. It fitted what I wanted to do in terms of communicating with people, helping people get started. That's kind of what I do. Um, so diagrams uh, really played a big part in that. Um, the video is still up there. It's still free on Trailhead. There are links at the end. The video is being recorded. Okay, it's broken now. Let's keep going. Um, so yeah, anyway, 2022, I dusted off for London's calling, and um, it's had a few more outings since. But back in the day, there wasn't really a lot of content like this, and now there is so much better content. So I think it's time that we sort of put this to sleep, as it were. But what we'll have a look today, we'll recap diagram and Salesforce solutions. We'll talk about how you extract, structure, validate, and communicate the information. Uh, that comes to you as an architect. That's really our, our key jobs as architects, part-time therapist, part-time semi-programmer, you know, late at night, let's write some programs. Um, but really, it's about telling the story. And to do that, I think you can start with four key diagrams. Um, and I work on a lot of um, RFP responses, as you might imagine working for a big SI now. Um, it still goes back to the same technique. You need to read through what they're telling you and extract out and then in some way read it back uh, and often time that you do that with diagrams. Um, I added in, in around 2000, uh, 2022, what wasn't in the original plural site, which is sequences, capabilities and processes, always good for storytelling. Um, and at the end, depending on time, uh, we'll look at Salesforce templates and diagramming framework and maybe some other tools. So 2017, Salt Lake City, fluid Salt Lake City, Jet Set Lifestyle, uh, met with Don, Made the video. Uh, I wasn't an architect at this point, I would say. Um, why? Well, I didn't have grey hair. If you want to get credibility as an architect, you need to look quite old and tired. Grey hair, glasses are a plus. Yeah. <laughs> Honestly, you know, it's people take you so much more seriously. Um, but it, it, was a really, um, it was a really interesting exercise to be able to break down what I had learned for myself. And none of this, honestly, was new knowledge. You know, you can go out and study it. But I'm very much somebody who learns by doing. So there we was, we read it back. And what was in it? Well, really, just, you know, we went um, by hand going through the extraction and uh, the, the creation of diagrams, which we'll talk about in a minute. Uh, and then in about 2019, um, I was having another go at the CTA thing, as was uh, Gemma Blazard. So we made some YouTube videos uh, together, which are still up on Lazeby Architect. So if you want to see me fumble my way through that, that is my kitchen wall in my old house. Um, and diagram in real time, don't do that if you're going to take an exam. But Universal it was certainly a good time. Universal Racing, I think that was it. Universal Racing, I think I wish Universal Racing was a real one. There was another one which Salesforce didn't want us to broadcast, so we changed the name. Oh, yeah. But then they complained to Gemma and told us to take it down anyway, so never mind. So what's the challenge, if you're still with me? Um, so the challenge is usually the same. Information will come to you. It might be that it's been captured by a BA, it might be that it's some um, request for proposal, or request for information that's come through from a client. Um, it might be that you're working at, at your own organization and you've, you've pulled all this together. And really what you need to do is take information that's in um, prose, maybe poetry, um, and extract it into um, a solution that you can then validate with people how do you validate it with people? Well, you shop it around and talk to them. Um, and that's really sort of 
the consultancy aspect of being an architect, I would say. Um, so the technique that I use, and, and still use today, and this isn't gospel, you, you know, you can vary it as, as, as needs really, but um, these are the standard things that you're always going to need. You're going to need to know, as you go through the document, um, who are the actors? Why do you need to say the actors? Well, it's probably that's going to relate to the licenses that you would need to apply in Salesforce, which probably at the end of the day um, relates to money, uh, either what money the what client's going to have to spend or what they've already bought and then what they're going to have to swap because they've got the right stuff, which happens about nine times out of ten. Uh, you're going to need the systems. So there'll be systems there which they want to get rid of, the systems they want to keep, there'll be systems that are new. And so uh, what I do with, with both the licenses and with the status is, in brackets, just make a note of you know, things that are pertinent to it. So is it a new system? Is it external? Is it going to be replaced? Et cetera, et cetera. Why? Because you don't want to have to read through the document again and again and again. And if you're anything like me, you get a bit word blind and you can't, where, where was that? Can't find it, can't find it. So if you can capture and extract as much as possible in the first reading or you know, the first, first two readings, you're off on a winner. You're also looking for your Salesforce objects. So uh, these are entities, so anything that might store data. How would you know this if you don't have any experience in technology? If you don't have any experience in technology, you're gonna find this harder. But with practice, it comes. So if you have a background as a developer or a consultant or a business analyst, it's gonna be easier. Um, but certainly, you know, with a bit of trailhead these days and a bit of exposure to Salesforce, you can get the hang of it and identify, oh, that looks like an account. Oh, that looks like a lead. We can talk about what's a, what's a lead and what's an opportunity some other time. Um, again, you note some information uh, that goes along with it. So things like road count and who might be the owner with regard to the actors above, that's also really handy when you come to do your diagrams. And then the last one is, as per our little quiz that Sam ran, um, some sort of into the integration catalog or first version of an integration catalog. I just make rough notes about, is it going one way, is it going two way? If you wanted to, you can put uh, brackets after it about, you know, oh, this is going to be soap, this is going to be rest, whatever you want to do, right? Whatever is going to be, um, whatever information is given you. It's like some of the RFPs I see, not very much information. <sighs> a bit breathless, sorry. Right, so, um, what do we use? Main four key diagrams. What are those diagrams? Day model, system landscape, role hierarchy, and then some sort of story around um, environments and deployment. Um, I was almost tempted to mix it up there and go backwards, but let's play by the rules. So, Salesforce data model. Why Salesforce data model? Let's have a look. Oh, hang on a sec, I forgot this one. So, what do you use with diagrams? You use the diagrams to shop it around and communicate and align with people. This is what I've understood, is this right? This is how I think this could work. Do you think that would work for you? It's those kinds of conversations. And it's much easier to have a page on the table or a picture on a whiteboard and I'm always a big fan of real world things versus virtual things, although like Mural and Miro, you can, you can, you can do it. Um, but if you can get people to pick up a pen and go start drawing on it, that's it, you've won, you've hooked them. Right, they're on board with you. Um, so those kinds of things are really kind of key to success. Um, and you can use it with those groups and you know, do lots of, lots of things with it, right? <sighs> Must breathe, right. <laughs> Um, and they're a living asset as well. So, you know, whether you're keeping them on PowerPoint or in a system, um, you know, these are useful things and you can, you know, keep them, refine them, refine them for the project you're working on, keep them as a little catalogue, a little scrapbook that you can roll out on different projects. So, data model tells you the story of how the object's related, uh, what the record types and owners, uh, what the org wide defaults might be and any objects that might have large data volumes. You'll note that some of those things are hopefully what you've put on your lists in brackets, and that's how you don't have to go back and, and do it again, and read it again. Role hierarchy tells you about who's external, who's external, sorry, who's internal, who's external. Um, again, this is about the actors, right? Role hierarchy is about who the users of the system, whereabouts do they sit in terms of the data visibility within the Salesforce. Um, also shows how the object owners are related, so you can get that uh, sharing through the role hierarchy, and then where do you need to use uh, sharing rules. Um, also record ownership, which is key principle of um, 
data visibility in Salesforce. And the system landscape. So system landscape, I don't do them like this anymore because it's a bit busy, but a picture of some boxes and some arrows really helps people. It's amazing. If you just put boxes even with no arrows, somebody will say, what about system X? I don't see it on there. Or they'll say, actually that system you know, isn't connected to this other system. So having it down visually really helps to get people to tune in rather than seeing words on the page. Um, key things, you know, what are the sales, what's the sales force you just bought? What are the systems that you currently own and might be wanting to get rid of? What systems are on-prem? Um, what systems might need firewalls arranging for them? We want to go live in 12 months, better start having the conversation with Cyber now about those firewall rules. And last, <sighs> got to go back to yoga. <laughs> it's been a busy day. Um, last is um, testing and deployment management. Why this? So it's funny, I just kind of, back in the day, I used to just do this automatically because I was told I needed to do it, right? Oh, you need to tell us this. But actually, the amount of people, the amount of people on you know, the customer side, on the user side, even you know, experienced IT people that don't understand the significance of this, um, this almost ends up being the most used uh, diagram um, in, in recent times for me. You need to explain to people that, hey, we need different environments. Okay, yeah, I get it, we do that with SAP. Okay, good. Um, this is how you get the changes between those different systems. It's not a binary, there is no gold build. We've got to push and pull meta metadata um, if we don't have a tool to do it, we're going to need some developer and tie them up for about 75% mm, of their time to pull the stuff out and then wrangle the package XML and try and shove it in. And by the way, that's not just a production, you know, that's in all the environments. Oh, by the way, we want stuff coming back the other way as well. Maybe we need a tool to do that, right? So that picture actually is very, very useful. And I've probably talked through all of my pictures now. So, okay, so data model. What can we do to make the data model better? We can put more stuff on it. And this is the same sort of stuff that we noted when we were extracting the requirements. So what do we think the all-wide defaults might be? Is this a private object? Is this a public object? Always good to get a start of a 10. Uh, number of rows, so that's something we, we hopefully noted down or could extrapolate out based on what was written in the document. And if we don't know it, that's something that we can put on our list of questions to go and ask people. Um, and then in terms of the owners, what is their role within the role hierarchy and, you know, what sort of relationship is it? So there's a lookup relationship, is a master detail, your Salesforce architect, so you understand the significance of that. So if you put that on the diagram itself, and this is highly simplified, you can use it to start to pot spot, start to spot hot spots. Um, and again, this, is, this, this actually help has saved me on a couple of occasions because, you know, you might sort of do back of an envelope calculations as you're reading through, but if you follow the links and you go, okay, well, opportunity line items times number of orders times whatever, oh, that's a big number. Are we going to be okay with that? Um, and it you know, really helps you to understand, okay, we need to pay attention to that. Doesn't mean anything bad's going to happen necessarily, right? but you need to pay attention to it. So we come to the role hierarchy. That's really how we can use um, uh, we can use the two things together, right? So we've got our data model, which is highlighted to us. There's a large amount of data on this particular record. And then as we look at the role hierarchy, uh, we can say, well, actually, we're going to need a sharing rule between these two sets of users. Ah, is that going to be a problem? Now, in this instance, it's not because the, that particular object is owned by a parent, but if it was custom object with its own owner, that might cause an impact in performance in terms of sharing recalculations and reporting. System landscape, so this is pretty busy, I don't do like doing like this anymore in terms of la loading stuff on, it's normally enough just to have you know, a few arrows indicating uh, key things going on. But as you see, you can, you can do different versions of this, right? So you can have an as is, okay, this is how the landscape looks today. You can have the target, which is the dream that we'll never actually manage to get to, but you know, we'd like to do. Um, and then you can have incremental stages in between. You can also do something like a one-pager, which is great for discussion. So you can have a combined diagram that says, well, here's kind of what we're trying to do, and here's the things that we're going to kill off, here's the new systems we're going to add in, and you don't need to be flicking around. Yeah, so it's a great sort of thing to have on a piece of paper um, in your bag um, that you can then put on the table if you're meeting people in person. 
which is a rare thing these days, but also very useful. And a quote from the engagement manager um, who beasted me relentlessly when I was at McKinsey, um, which was hard when you're 40, um, always have a page. If you always have a page, your page is the right page. <laughs> right? It's true. If you've got these in your bag or in your, in, in, on your laptop, you can just bring it up on a call in a meeting. Oh yes, uh, something like this, you know. But yeah, and then you're in the driving seat and you stop people wandering off, talking about all sorts of things that probably aren't relevant. So you can do other flavors of system landscape. So <laughs> Francis might recognise this from today. Um, <laughs> You can use it to tell stories, so rather than being uber technical, you can make it a bit more friendly. And you say, oh yeah, these bits of Salesforce all sort of fit together. These are the things that you paid money for, um, look how they all work together to solve your problems, and then here's how we're going to talk to the other systems, yeah? So, you want to use CTI integration, okay, let's talk about that. You want to use Marketing Cloud, let's talk about the standard connector, good and bad. Um, and then likewise down the bottom, you can talk about you know, different third party systems and how middleware is going to help you out. And then last of all, deployment, I think we covered that, but you know, there's lots and lots there. Uh, that was a horrible diagram. Uh, Melissa has a better diagram that I stole uh, from her presentation, DevOps Dreaming. So um, I, can't, um, I can't restate enough how much this diagram comes up when you have to explain to people um, you know, about deployment, test environment management, test data management, uh, test, uh, test automation, um, all of these things. So that's our four pictures. How are we doing for time? Nice. What do you think, Tom? How are we doing? Yeah, we're okay. That didn't help me out. Uh, we're yeah, 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 okay, we're good, we're good. Okay, so let's have a look at some other ones. Oh, let's go back. So let's have a look at some other ones that I added in. Let me just have some of my Homer beer over here. Has anyone got any questions while I catch my breath? <laughs> How long has it been since you've done yoga and Matt? <laughs> <laughs> About as long as I've been doing this, I think. <laughs> so, <sighs> the breathing exercises. Do some Wim Hof stuff. <clears throat> Um, okay, so sequence diagrams. So um, sequence diagrams are very much in another everyday tool. So when you've got to talk about, okay, how things are gonna happen in a particular order, particularly between multiple systems. And this is a funny thing, by the way, just as an aside. Clients go to cloud systems because they think it's gonna simplify everything. They're quite happily running on a, on a 15 year old .NET system that just runs in one VM and everything happens there. The CRM's there, the billing's there, the ERP's there. And then they break everything out into separate products and you're like, okay, now we've got to do a lot of integration. So this is where you can talk about integration, particularly with regard to identity management. So um, things like SAML, things like OAuth, uh, they're the classic ones for, um, you know, for sequence diagrams, but absolutely with integration, you know, integration between Salesforce and SAP. So you go Salesforce, Neosoft, Neosoft, CPI, CPI, SAP. And then you go talk to the SAP architects about that. Anybody a recovering SAP architect? <laughs> Any SAP architects in the room? Nobody's going to admit to it. You're all far too exciting for that. Um, that's from Cloud Sundial, so that's Lawrence Newcomb. Um, Newcomb, not Newcomb. Uh, it's not Donald Trump. Um, but Cloud Sundial, I've got all the links at the end. Jokes available on request. Uh, <laughs> capabilities. So, uh, so this uh, capabilities map, uh, so this one I ripped off the Salesforce website. I love capabilities because capabilities allow you to move forward with a, with a client or, you know, at, at your business. Typically, people are used to talking about things at system level. We need to change SAP. Well, that's never going to happen. We need to take the CRM capabilities out of SAP and put it into Salesforce. Now, that's a bit more of a conversation you can have. So when you're talking about capabilities, it's a nice middle ground between processes that business analysts and the people who work in that area of the business understand, and systems that are just sort of big with a price tag on them. So when you break things down into capabilities, it's kind of specific enough but general enough that you can have a conversation around case management. How are we going to do that? Or is it complaints management? Or you know, is it um, you know, customer returns? What is it? Yeah. So capabilities, capability diagrams. 
And if you want to make your life really easy as an architect, um, I used to have to make capabilities up off the top of my head. Um, don't do that anymore. Just go to this uh, lovely resource from some enterprise architects at Salesforce, created a few years ago now. Um, and they've got this uh, Prezi presentation, which has got capability cards on it um, by all of the clouds that you know and love. So if you go and look, you say, sales cloud, what does it do? Well, you know, you could describe it this way in terms of capabilities. Recognize these sorts of things, makes sense, right? So if you go to a salesperson and say, hey, let's talk about account management, they're going to kind of get it, right? So if you go to them and you know, talk about, hey, I want to talk to you about uh, Salesforce, they'll be like, oh, this is awesome, man, but that's the end of the conversation. So capability is really good, and then the capability card is also really awesome because they talk to you about the functionality and the KPIs, best practices, that sort of stuff. So use it. <laughs> Uh, here's capability map example. We'll see if this works because we're on a Zoom call. Uh, this, go, this comes from about 2019, 2018, um, where I didn't have those capabilities. I made them up. So anyway, this was this was for a, a company where they did have that monolithic system, which was the, the thing in red and pink. And they're like, oh, we want to move away from the monolithic system. Okay, we're going to need integration then. So you know, we're using a series of diagrams now to walk them through what's going to happen. Okay, so you know, you've changed, got rid of the red stuff, you have some blue stuff, which is Salesforce, you have some green stuff, which is Zora, and you're going to have some yellow stuff, which is other stuff, and in lots of integration. And we're like, oh, okay, well, yeah, that's really good, but it's been abstract for us. So when I was talking to the head of marketing, I said, well, let's look at it from a people point of view, and then see if this actually works. Let's rearrange those capabilities <laughs> for people. And then let's talk about how we're going to put the customer at the heart of everything. So a bit of storytelling, but it helps people to relate to it. So it's very much play to your audience. So it's just a capability diagram, but I made the capabilities dance a little bit. <laughs> they love that, but they still didn't get it. So, you know, there <laughs> wasn't really much hope for them. Um, so process maps, process maps. There you go, process maps, process maps. We, do we used to call those flow charts? <laughs> Okay, and then in a similar vein, you can use process maps also from the same project. Um, you can use process maps to kind of again walk people through and say, hey, we're going to need a lot of integration now, and you want sub second response after they've checked out to provisioning them on your uh, digital media system. Let me show you why that's hard because we have to walk through all of these steps, right? So you can walk through all these steps and say, okay, well, what could we do, right? But it's basically lots of messages have to fly between lots of systems because you know we've got a CPQ system, we've got an identity system, or we've got like the flow <laughs> registration in the middle. And, yeah, so you can walk people through, the stakeholders through the story uh, in terms that they relate. If you were doing the same thing with a technical audience, probably be a sequence diagram, right? They would get, would get that more. So it's really horses for courses when it comes to that sort of stuff. Uh, logical landscape, I think I put a duck on there because it was rubber ducking, it was sort of, you know, talking to myself about, okay, how are we going to tell this story, but very much showing how things fit together um, in terms of the aspirations of the client. Um, and then this is sort of extending the capabilities diagram a little bit more and talking about sort of channels and capabilities, so capabilities in the chocolate box, uh, you can kind of organise them by cloud so people recognise them. Those are all straight off the capability cards, by the way. So, you know, just, just have at it. Then you put your channels across the top. Okay, so how we integrate, how we integrate, how we engage in with people. So, you know, we're doing it through voice, we're doing it through the web, blah, 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 blah. Um, and it just gives you a really good um, starting point to have a conversation. Then the client says, okay, how are you going to make it work for us? You say, well, okay, let's put it all on one page so we can talk about it. So down the bottom is those capabilities that I just showed you, but we can't make them all be 100% uh, from day one. So instead, I'll show you from a timeline point of view how we're going to grow those capabilities. We're going to start working on these particular capabilities at a point in time, and we're going to mature what it does, how, much, how many processes use those capabilities, how sophisticated they are over time. And then up the top is all the stuff you asked for, and then if you want to know how much it's going to cost to install, as you can see, we need to like ramp up on the resources there in the middle. So you know, we go from one squad to two squads to three squads, and then we get to the end and we collapse down a bit. So kind of bringing everything together onto one page 
And again, that sort of one page to hold people's attention um, you know, is really, really useful for discussion. Any questions? Yeah, maybe one on this timeline view, right? Yeah, go on, let's do it. Uh, a very similar scenario which I'm facing in my work. Sometimes you will have to customize this to the client's budget, right? I know you have phase one, phase two, phase three. So the client is going to say, hey, I really like your end view of architecture, but I have so much to spend in phase one. And depending on how the results go, we look for a future, right? So in a way, the responsibility is on you to make it scalable for the future, but you're also architecting within that budget. So how do you bring that lens on this? So you'd have like less budget, which means less people, which means either it's you know going to take longer or we're going to do less stuff. So it might be like, okay, well uh, you know we'll scale back on the field service. You know the guys do it today, ex you know particular way. You know let's continue to do that. And I think this is an example of where, and I, you know I've, I've been like this as well, which is like you're really excited about this technology. You're really excited about the cool shit you can build. You're like I'm going to build this for you, and it's going to be amazing. It's going to change your life. Problem is, real life gets in the way and they don't have all the money in the world. So you have to then take a step back and put yourself in their shoes and say, well, okay, what's gonna make a difference to the business here, right? What's gonna reduce cost? What's gonna increase profit? What's gonna increase efficiency? So it's very much sort of um, taking a more mature view on the situation yourself as an architect in order that you can engage with the, with the stakeholders, right? And I think in that vein, that's more you know, what's traditionally called an enterprise architect type role, as opposed to a technical architect where you're like, you know, some other guy's gonna sort it out for me, I'm gonna build the coolest shit and it's gonna work in the coolest way, right? So all architects are not the same, you play to your strengths, right? I'm very much the, okay, here's what we can do for you, you know, given your budget and you know, given your aspirations, here's the gap in the middle. And it might be there's two versions of this, right? Which is, here's the ideal and then here's what you can afford. Which is like not very much. <laughs> no, 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 that's not true. Oh, Nathaniel. Nathaniel. Okay. Um, so you talked about a little bit about you know keep, keeping uh, referring back to these documents and keeping these as a, as live living documents, not just a something that you draw once and forget about. Do you ever talk a little bit more about kind of that? ongoing conversation and the shifting requirements as the uh, as the project goes on and how the, those, those yeah. programs move yeah. and shift. So uh, selfishly, these are your tools for you to be successful and help the client to be successful. Could they be put into the repository and be part of the project? You know, yes they could. What happens if you leave? Well, they probably stagnate at that point. In terms of keeping versions, um, it's always good, I think, to have things at particular checkpoints. So whether that's, you know, sort of, I think Sprint's probably too much, but at least I don't have time to update everything at Sprint level. But, you know, certainly, you know, within work packages, so like sort of quarterly, you know, here's what we plan to do, here's what we actually did. You know, you can kind of do a retrospective on some of this, right? Um, and then, you know, put that, you know, Sam was mentioning governance at the beginning. Um, you, know, you can put that then as artifacts of, well, here we're, here's where we were, we worked on projects like this, right? Mm -hmm. uh, cover your ass. Here's where we were at this point, and you know, then we didn't get to where we wanted to be next time because, and you know, that, that would then you know, go along with other less visual artifacts like you know, your raid log, um, you know, where you were talking about all the things that were, you know, that were getting in the way. Does that kind of answer the question a bit? It's so, you know, this isn't, you know, these are very much tools for the job, I would say. Um, and even six and a half years on, I'm still trying to work out, okay, why are things useful and what things are more useful than others? But it's very much sort of tools of the trade, I would say. What well, you need is a platform. <laughs> well, you need a platform solution. You need a customer engagement platform. That's really what you need. Yeah, platform that you link all your metadata and see what we've delivered in front of you. It's a configurable metadata platform. Um, okay, so I'm probably running late now, so and we want to go, we go play the beer tap again. So, um, like I said, none of this existed back in 2017 sort of time frame, but now Salesforce Architects um, are on the storm uh, in terms of the, um, the enablement team uh, at Salesforce, so they have lots and lots of wonderful stuff. As, does it, has anybody not been on the, oh, no, who's been on the Salesforce Architects website? 
Okay, thank goodness. Right. <laughs> good news. There you go. Parker, money well spent. Yeah, so you know all the good stuff that's on there. Uh, so tools and resources. So uh, this is you know, still the bit.ly link from uh, um, London School of 22. Um, but you've got the architect's website. There's the link to the Pluralsight video where you can see me without grey hair. Um, practice. So there's practice scenarios, plenty of practice scenarios available um, more and more. Um, I did say with paper and pencil, and one of the top questions for the presentation is what tools do you recommend? <laughs> paper and pencil, and then whatever tool you want, I use PowerPoint. Um, it's not the greatest in some ways, but it makes me keep things simple, which I find works well with stakeholders. <laughs> but it could be Lucid, it could be Mural, it could be Elements, uh, or it could be anything, and you put it into Elements. Um, so, you know, all useful. Build your own library, and other people say, can I have a copy of your things for my own library? No, build your own library, right? Because it's your story that you're telling, right? That's really where your value is. Can you tell the story? So that's what we did, so we recapped it. And there's a QR code, which probably still works as well. We talked about extracting and structuring. We talked about the four diagrams. We talked about all the capabilities and uh, sequences and how wonderful Salesforce Architects is. So that's it. Farewell, thank you. <laughs>